Good morning. <clears throat> Try that again. Good morning. Let me invite you to take your Bible and open the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And kind of go over some things relative to our local church here as of late. And we're going to continue in that same vein this morning. This is a very practical section in the book of Ephesians. Verse four, chapter 4, verse 29, it's a powerful verse which we're going to look at today. I'm going to begin by reading it. Let no corrupt word, or if you have a King James, communication proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? Powerful in so many ways. When I was a kid, there was a phrase going around, I don't know if it still is or not, but sticks and snows may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I can't think of anything more untrue. Uh, kind of a silly chant. In fact, I think I first saw it on a cartoon. Uh, most people tell you that it's very possible that the pain associated with being on the receiving end of negative words is far more brutal than physical pain in some cases. And sticks may bruise your body for a time, but words can bruise our spirit for many years. Our words have power. I trust you recognize that. Power to hurt, power to heal. They have power to build up. They have power to tear down. They have power to help or power to destroy. Uh, we can see it. Here's an example of how words uh, can be very powerful to help. I think a mother and a child cooing words of comfort, and then we're probably all familiar with this scenario as well. Uh, probably there's quite a few pictures I probably could have put up for that. I think that will suffice. The point is our speech is obviously very significant. Uh, our words matter. They say the average individual uh, speaks between 15 and 25,000 words a day. I don't know if they split that up by gender, but uh, you know, with so many words around, it's often to really not take them as seriously as we should. Paul Tripp, in his word, War of Words, wrote, When we speak, it must be with the realization that God has given our words significance. He's ordained for them to be important. God has given words value, so we must do all we can to assign words the importance that Scripture gives them. And there's many things in the book of Proverbs that talk about our speech. Here's one. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. I'm sure that at some point in your existence you have been on the receiving end of some cutting words which did not make you feel good. What you might not be as keenly aware of is that you've been on the other end of that spectrum, you've been giving those cutting words out. You know, ironically, we live in a world where people pay money to watch comedians today whip jokes out that are laced with sarcasm. They can tear someone to shreds and that's all done in the name of humor. And uh, you turn on the TV, which I really don't watch, but occasionally when I do see a sitcom, it usually the humor is at the expense of someone else. And uh, it's often demeaning. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of talk can exist in a home. In fact, what, the trouble with that kind of talk, that it's, it's so pervasive that it's been normalized in our society, and that carries over into the church, and that's really the last place that that kind of thing should exist. Demeaning another believer, or God-ordained authority in Christ in the name of humor, that is corrupt communication. It's communication where the love of Christ is not expressed, edification is not realized, and this is counter to what we read here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. I mean, sometimes hurtful words are retained for a lifetime. You know, if you think about this section here in Ephesians chapter 4, it's just interesting because when it comes to the church of Jesus Christ, we're all, as we've seen, interrelated. We are connected to each other, and we will be for all eternity. And so the emphasis in the New Testament is on those relationships. This section begins in verse 25, where Paul says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. And so notice the relational, relational aspect here, and our mouth. Verse 26, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down in your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, again affecting a relationship, but rather let him labor, working with his hands with what is good, that he may have something to give him who has a need. 
Again, verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for necessary edification, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So we're not to lie and deceive each other. We're members of one another. You're not to steal from one another. Again, that's affecting the relationship. And though there's a time for righteous anger, it's not to cross over into sinful, selfish anger in which we sin against one another. And we both understand what it means to use words to build up and words to tear down. It's funny how it's, the average individual is very quick to point out how someone offended them and yet we're very slow oftentimes to admit that we may have offended someone else. But apart from the grace of God, we're really not very good at controlling our tongues. None of us is innocent. Um, but I just think if this was applied in the power of the Spirit of God, uh, the church can be what God intended it to be, a, a place of refuge from the rotten, stinking world around us. And so Ephesians 4.29 is designed to bring a radical change in all our relationships relative to the world's standard. But we have to apply it conscientiously in the strength that God provides or we'll never realize it. More damage can be done with the tongue than by any other means. Uh, my mom, since I was one of uh, six children, she should say, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything, anything at all. I certainly said that to my children at times. Uh, but James even has much to say about the tongue. In James chapter 3, verses 5 through 8, it says, Even so, the tongue is a little member, but it boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire. It's not like a fire. It is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it's set on fire by hell. Strong words. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Didn't really sugarcoat much there, did he? An unruly evil. You recognize your tongue as such. Now, our tongues have been given to us by God, and they're to be used actually for his glory. As even verse 29 here tells us, we're to use it to build one another up. But if you read 1 Peter 2.9, we're a chosen generation in Christ. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're his own special people. And what is our privilege? The word that means in order that. That's a purpose clause. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous lights. This is how God wants us to use our tongues. To praise him. To honor him. To put our tongues to good use so that even teaching the word of God or sharing the word of God is a good use of your tongue. And how much is he grieved as we see him when we take the same mouth that is to be sanctified for his high uses and abuse it by allowing that which is corrupt and defiling to proceed out of our mouth, especially towards someone else that Christ loves dearly. In fact, Christ, or James goes on to say in the next two verses, with the tongue we bless our God and Father, and with the tongue we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not so to be. It's kind of weird how we can praise God and remind others of his goodness, and yet two seconds later we can be trashing someone and vilifying someone in a very self-seeking way. It's amazing, isn't it? Not surprising, in our flesh dwells no good thing. Just as a lion roars before he jumps on his prey, it's easy to wander, let our mouth wander, before we wander with our feet. But nothing hurts a church like corrupt words or corrupt communication. Now, this doesn't mean that correction isn't needed at times. This doesn't mean rebuke is needed in time, at times. But our words are to communicate love, and all those things to be done in love so that edification is in view. Our Mouths are not to be used in a way to punish one another, but ultimately to encourage one another, even though that might include some correction. The writer of the book of Hebrews put it this way, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, even so much the more as we see the day approaching. We're to use our mouths to encourage one another, to stir one another up to love and good works. 
You know, the Corinthian church, by contrast, was characterized by envy, strife, and division. And so when they came together, it was actually for the worse. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. Instead of love being present and edification being present, it was envy, strife, and division. Gee, can I come? Oh, man. And so when you have backbiting and gossiping and criticalness, when that pervades an assembly, Satan is rejoicing and our Holy Spirit is grieved. So what is corrupt words? What is corrupt communication? Look at verse 29 there. Corrupt is a Greek word, sapros, and it means worthless. Primarily means rotten, putrefied, or poor quality, unfit to be used. That's a pretty descriptive definition. The basic meaning relates to the process of decay. In fact, the word was used of things unusable, unfit or bad. It describes that which is harmful due to the fact that it is corrupt, corrupting, or defiling. And so it's rotten, useless, decaying, worthless. The word was used to describe fish that were rotting. Isn't that lovely? In fact, one preacher put it this way, that such rotten speech like rotten fruit or rotten fish will not nourish anyone. How true. It contaminates. It will make you sick. It smells bad. It creates an unpleasant atmosphere for anyone who gets near it. That is really the essence of rotten, corrupt speech. I mean, how many times, if we're honest with each other, could we stop and say, did I really have to say that? Chances are you didn't. I mean, if you're like me, undoubtedly you've regretted saying some things. And you wish you have not have said it. You wish you could take it back. You know, this word saffros is only used one other time in the New Testament by one other person. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was always in contrast to that which is good and beneficial and that which was rotten. Christ used the word here in Matthew 7. He said, even so, every good tree bears good fruit. And the word Saffros is translated bad here, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. The context there was false teaching. In fact, <clears throat> Jesus used the same imagery when talking about trees here. So corrupt here is that which brings forth evil and not righteousness. So if you think of corrupt, the net result is not righteous, but that which is evil. Christ again used this word in Matthew 12, later in the same gospel. He says, either make the tree good, or its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, or its fruit corrupt, for a tree is known by its fruit. Oh, you generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Again, he's talking to the false teachers there. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that is the real issue. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so Christ makes a contrast based on the heart. Corrupt speech comes from a corrupt heart. Pure speech comes from a pure heart. And so we can say the indicator of a personal spiritual state at the time of speech is what the condition of his heart is. And so the words we use and the words we don't use really come from our heart. The source of our speech is our hearts. The Pharisees were unsaved and therefore out of their corrupt heart came bad words, words that were untrue, words that were not designed to build up, but words that actually did the opposite. They ruined the hearers spiritually through that false teaching. And so Christ condemned them. But this is reflective of the real problem we all have. We all have a heart problem. We're born with a heart problem. Jeremiah summed it this way, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You and I were born with deceitful hearts. I trust you recognize that. If you're not, you need to take a long look in the mirror and reevaluate. In fact, Christ reiterated it in Mark 7 with these words. From within, notice, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. The Pharisees were saying, these dudes eat without washing their hands. Big deal. 
Let's look at your heart. From out of your heart comes the things that indicate that you're defiled. It's an extension of your heart is what defiles you. And we're all born with a corrupt heart, and so we're all defiled. And it's beyond reformation. We need a new heart. That's the answer for everyone. You know, the Bible's very clear that God is holy and just. He's sovereign. He's righteous. He's perfect in every way. He's given mankind a standard in which we, you and I can evaluate ourselves by. Ten Commandments, and as you and I evaluate, when it says, Thou shalt not lie, we say, Hmm. I'm a liar. Thou shalt not steal. I've ripped somebody off. Thou shalt obey mom and dad. We don't have time to even discuss that one. We're all guilty, which means the Bible says we're a sinner. And the wages of sin is death. We're all deserving of death. In fact, ultimately, we're deserving of hell. That is the righteous punishment for each one of us who has rebelled against the holy God. But God is love. And so in recognizing the sin barrier that existed between him and man, he recognized and he wants you and I and all mankind to recognize that there's nothing we can do to remove that sin. You could get baptized in every church in town that does not remove sin. You can't do it. You could try good works to outweigh your bad. You don't have a snowball's chance at that because even if one good work paid off one sin, you're so far in the hole you could never crawl out. Sincerity. People say, well, I'm sincere, and God knows I'm sincere. Yes, you're sincere. You might be sincere, humanly speaking, on a relative basis. But sincerity, you've also sincerely rebelled against God. And therefore, punishment needs to be paid. But I've been confirmed. And the list goes on and on and on. See, the reality is, is that none of those things remove sin, and that's why Christ came. Christ came, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, to be sin in our place. He was sinless. He was God who became a man. He came, and he took upon himself all the filth of our hearts. Amazingly. And he was buried and rose again. And when he was on that cross, all of your sins, all of my sins, were paid for by him in full. And that's why he cried out, it is finished. Amazing. The penalty you and I deserve to pay was paid for in love by another. An innocent substitute who came as the Lamb of God to once and for all take away the sin of mankind. And so your sins have been paid for. My sins have been paid for. But not everyone is forgiven because a decision needs to be made to accept that payment. And the moment... Someone transfers their faith from that which cannot save, some aspect of themselves, some aspect of their church or their good works or some ritual they've gone through. When they recognize that doesn't do it and they put all their faith in Christ, they receive as a free gift everlasting life. And they get a brand new heart. Unfortunately, they retain that sin nature. But the issue here, well, here is we think, Christ also noticed suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Notice that he might bring us to God. He's the Savior. We don't bring ourselves there. He does it because he was put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. And that's why Christ said in John 14, 6, that he and he alone is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through him. So the issue is, will you believe? As Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So there are no good works to do for salvation. You can go to church regularly. You could give money, charity. You could get water baptized, make a commitment. You could ask Jesus into your heart. You could invite God into your life. You could partake in the sacraments. You could pray a prayer. You could stay in faithful and true to Jesus and repent from all your sins. But these are things you do in hopes that God would accept you. <clears throat> the issue in salvation is trust, trusting what he already did for you and putting all your apples in that basket and that alone. There are no good works you can do for salvation. That's why Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says salvation is by grace. Grace means you get something you don't deserve. It's undeserved kindness and favor. How? Through faith in Christ. And notice, it has nothing to do with what you do. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. It's not of works. Otherwise, you could stand up here this morning and say, <laughs> did you see what I did there, God? Thank you very much. God says, yeah, I did see it, and I can't accept it because it stems from my rotten heart. And therefore, it's a filthy rag. I want you to be impressed with, that, with what I did for you in the person of Jesus Christ. But there's a spiritual battle that takes place in every believer. See, according to, if you look at Ephesians 4 here, if you jump to two, verse 22, it says, You put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Your old man was crucified with Christ. You no longer have to obey that sin nature that resides in you, so you reckon yourself to be dead to it because it's corrupt. It will always be corrupt. It can't be anything but corrupt, and it never changes. 
You've been given a new change, a new man, verse 24, put on a new man which is created according to God, notice, in true righteousness and holiness. And so God gave you a new nature in the Holy Spirit which is created in righteousness and holiness so that as you present yourself to him, that's what can be manifested in your life. That's the battle. And so you have a new nature in the Holy Spirit. Its objective is to glorify Jesus Christ and to put him first. And what that looks like in your life is the fruit of the Spirit, that which is true and righteous and holy. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. And notice edifying speech. That's a byproduct of the Spirit of God working in you and through you. On the other hand, you have a sin nature that's all about you, and it always will be all about you, and it's corrupt from the word go. And that's where lying and envying and jealousy and hate and gossip and murder and malice and stealing and corrupt speech comes from. The issue is the source. In your flesh dwells no good thing, and so to expect your flesh to clean itself up so that you can have edifying words is the wrong expectation. This is why there's a battle going on in every believer, and Galatians tells us, this I say then, walk in or by means of the Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to empower you, enable you, and you won't fulfill those lusts of the flesh which never go away. Because the next verse tells us, the flesh is perpetually lusting against the spirit. The spirit is against the flesh. They're contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you want. So the issue is, who are you going to yield to? If you yield to that new nature, and allow the Holy Spirit to empower you, edifying speech can be realized. If you yield to that sin nature, corrupt speech is going to be the ultimate reality. That is the spiritual battle. And so you are to walk in a way that's worthy of your position in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not to walk like an unsaved person. And this can be realized in your life only because God has supplied the resources freely by his grace for it to take place. So as we think of this section here, in verse 25 we have a therefore. And he mentions things that we are to do and not do in light of the fact that we're a new creation in Christ. And Paul will give us a positive command and a corresponding negative command and a practical reason why it's to be true in your life and mine. That's what we saw. How we walk as believers is an indication of our fellowship with God and with each other. It has the potential to help or do damage. If I'm walking in the light as Christ is in light, enjoying fellowship with him, I can be used by the Spirit of God to be an edifying presence in your life. If I do not walk in the light, as Christ in the light, and I walk in the flesh, the potential for the opposite is true. Now, verse 25 begins with the therefore, and it means for this cause. Since you're a new creation in Christ, therefore, this is what it should look like and not look like. In fact, it says, you know what? You shouldn't be lying anymore. You should be speaking truth. It's okay to be righteous and angry, but don't let it go to sinful, selfish sin and anger. Deal with it. Why? If you don't, you give place to the devil. If you've been stealing, quit stealing. Instead, labor, work, be honest. Why? So you can have something to share with someone who has a need. And then it brings us to verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. The negative injunction here is let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. That's what it is. Again, we saw corrupt means rotten, worthless, useless. It smells. These are the words, again, that Christ used to describe the Pharisees. You know, false teaching qualifies as corrupt speech. That's interesting, isn't it? Because what the Pharisees taught by way of spiritual instruction was divorced from the truth. It was false, and the truth is in Jesus, and so it qualifies as corrupt speech. Isn't that interesting? And yet, we live in a world today where religious charlatans are very good at using Scripture in a way that was never intended. Satan was a master at this. He twisted Scripture when he tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Hey, I can quote Scripture here. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands you sh they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Totally out of the will of God. And so false teachers, the good ones, always use scripture in a way that it wasn't intended. Jesus answered correctly by using scripture in context by saying, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. 
And so as you think of corrupt word or corrupt communication or corrupt speech, it'll take your eyes off God and God's intentions and have you put exalting yourself at center stage. Corrupt speech always has a way of making you smell like a rose. It makes you look good. It's twisted in such a way that it's about you in some way, shape, or form. It's speech where it harms your neighbor, it harms your brothers and sisters in Christ. It does not promote their wholeness or holiness before the Lord. That's what it is. It's unwholesome speech. Now, you know, when you think of corrupt communication or corrupt words, people usually think of swearing or taking God's name in vain, and that's certainly corrupt and useless and unworthy. But again, corrupt communication draws a person in a, away from what God intends. You know, an example of what corrupt, unedifying speech would be Job's wife. How did she encourage her husband? Do you still hold fast your integrity, curse God, and die? Now that is corrupt speech. When you tell someone to curse God and die, that's really not encouraging, is it? And Job recognized her for what it was. He said, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this Job did not sin with his lips. So when you encourage someone to do something that God would not have them to do, that's corrupt speech. Uh, there's just no other way uh, to look at it. Again, it puts me first and it maligns the integrity of God. And yet the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And so when you're encouraging someone not to trust the Lord in their situation, that's corrupt speech. If you're encouraging them not to follow biblical principle, that's corrupt speech. You're not building up, you're tearing down. In fact, Job went on to say, the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what we call edifying speech. He didn't malign the character of God. He praised God even in the face of the worst trial imaginable. Great contrast there to indicate the difference between the two. Now, as you think of the word word in verse 29 here, it's the Greek word logos and it really means word. Now, when you couple that with the word no, which is the Greek words, two Greek words, may and pos, means not even one. So how many corrupt words are you allowed to give? Goose egg, zero, zilch, nada. That's humbling, isn't it? Mercy. Reminds me of what Christ said in Matthew 12, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Oh, that's humbling, isn't it? Which means every word that a child of God could speak, ultimately, and ideally, should result in edification or building up. That's amazing. Now, we think of the word corrupt. Again, it's, it means rotten or spoiled or stinky, but it also spreads. And corrupt talk, or in all words, communication that deters growth and godliness, that hinders, hinders the cultivation of godly relationships and defiles others, is corrupt. It has a decaying, rotting effect to it. And you know, we're all guilty of this. You know, a lot of times what destroys a church is that someone sticks their nose in someone else's business. They have no business sticking their nose into and they cast judgment without knowing all the facts and they want to weigh in on something that really doesn't concern them. I mean, how many times does that happen in a church? They make critical statements. They don't know all the facts. They badmouth people. They twist things in a way that paints a picture that they want it. It's all about them in some way. And it's a disaster. You know, Paul told the Corinthians, if you judged yourself, you wouldn't be judged. And they were too busy judging everyone else, and that's why they had envy, strife, and division within the assembly. 
our ungracious judgment of others often results in corrupt speech. I mean, blaming others came with the fall, and that's a major element in ungodly speech. I mean, how many times in the heated argument, well, you always and you never, blah, blah, blah. Those words never help at all. All they do is tear down. You're all, when you're using words like that, you're trying to punish someone in some way, not build them up. Those are corrupt words. Corrupt words include when we gripe and complain instead of seeing the hand of God in something. I mean, you hang around some people, all they do is gripe and complain, they find the negative in everything. I mean, always reminds me of that movie Airplane. The guy tells a story and everyone kills themselves because they can't handle his story. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. I mean, we talked about this. We are to do, uh, that would be all things without complaining and disputing. All things, right? You know, we tend to gripe about our difficult circumstances, the difficult people in our life. And God says, why don't you thank me for them instead? Why don't you thank me for them instead? And everything give thanks, even for this person. Yeah, because I'm taking this person, and I'm going to use them in your life to make you more like me. And if there wasn't a trial, this difficult person in your life, you'd be missing out on an opportunity to learn and understand and grow in Christ-like character. Really? Yeah. No, we live in a, a world where we're taught to be critical about everyone, we're taught to be fault finding. We're taught to point out the negative. When I worked in the paper industry and there was a pool of secretaries, there was one that could throw cold water and everything. She never had anything good to say about anybody or anything. She, had, she was a master at finding negative. I mean, there's 99 great things going on. Here's the one negative. She's all over it. Oh, mercy. And of course, rarely was her negative thoughts towards someone given face to face. It was always behind their back. Always looking for the flaws and not the good. Finding fault at every level and every corner. If you want to bring something down, be that person. And that's not coming from the Lord. That's coming from your flesh. And Satan wants to use your tongue to destroy everything that God says is good. Are you a critical person? Are you quick to find fault with things? Are you ungracious with people? Do you wait for them to make a mistake so you can jump all over them? I mean, that's exactly how the world operates. They wait for someone to fail, and they kick them when they're down. Right? If your words are not aimed at fixing or helping or healing, but only venting your spleen, that's corrupt words. That's corrupt communication. A critical spirit is an obsessive attitude of criticism and fault finding, which seeks to tear others down. Proverbs 12:18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of a wise promotes health. Do you want to be wise or piercing? There's that which tears down and there's that which builds up. Here's a riddle for you. I have no respect for justice. I maim without killing. I break hearts and ruin lives. I'm cunning and malicious and I gather strength with age. The more I'm quoted, the more I'm believed. I flourish at every level of society. My victims are helpless. They cannot protect themselves against me because I have no name and no face. To track me down is impossible. The harder you try, the more elusive I become. I'm nobody's friend. Once I tarnish your reputation, it is never the same. I topple governments and ruin marriages. I ruin careers and cause sleepless nights, heartache and indigestion. I spawn suspicion and generate grief. I make innocent people cry in their pillows. Even my name hisses. I am gossip. You know, gossip is one of the chief sins of the tongue. It's as damaging as it comes. And it's all tied in to an evil heart that wants to destroy someone and build you up. It's amazing, isn't it? It might be subtle, refined, intellectual, even couched in Christian terms, but it's evil. 
I mean, sometimes there's truth in gossip and slander. But the one telling has no need to know that, one you're telling has no need to know that information. You know, if you know something bad about a person, you suspect something, don't share it with anyone unless that person has a direct hand in the solution to the problem. If in doubt, don't talk about it. I mean, instruction to the nation of Israel, you should not go about as a talebearer among your people. Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. In fact, one of the indications you're walking with the Lord, according to James 1, 26, is this. If anyone thinks he is religious but doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart and his religion is useless. This is the one time that religion is used in a positive way in Scripture. If you're thinking you walk with the Lord, but your tongue is doing the opposite, you're deceived. Powerful, isn't it? Proverbs 13, 3, He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Gossip is the cruelest of weapons. It's against God's standard of preserving unity and lifting one another up. It serves no purpose but a selfish one. No good ever comes out of gossip. It's corrupt communication. You know, when someone wants to whisper in my mirror and tell me something bad about someone else, to no good end, I wonder what they're saying about me to someone else. When Corrupt communication falsely accuses someone, ruins their reputation to save their own. Because your flesh never wants to be seen in a bad light. So there... I mean, words are used to manipulate people, to badger people, to twist people. It profits nothing. Husbands will manipulate their wives with demeaning words. Wives will nag their husbands to death at times. Strife comes in. That's not to characterize us in our relationship because that's not who we are in Christ. Instead, verse 29, we're to speak what is good for necessary edification. That's the positive command. Speak what is good for necessary edification. You know, good is the Greek word agathos. It means suitable, serviceable, profitable, beneficial. It's the good opposed to the bad. It's in the singular here which emphasizes once again that every word is to be accounted for. And so what we should talk about should, have, should be good. It should help. It should encourage. Even through correction, the end in view should be edification. As we think of edification, it's Greek word okadome. It's literally the building of a house, but it came to refer to any building process. Now, figuratively, and this is most of the use in the New Testament, it refers to the process which one speaks words that build up, instruct, or improve spirituality. In fact, <clears throat> literally it reads, whatever is good or anything that is good for the building up of the need is what this reads, literally in the Greek. So what can we do to build one another up? How about encouragement and praise? Are you an encourager? Do you seek to help someone and encourage them to fight the good fight of faith? Or do you take them down another notch? How about showing appreciation and gratefulness? You know, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are also doing. You know, instead of finding the negative, find the positive. Some parents only criticize or correct their children instead of praising them and encouraging them. It's helpful in a marriage, obviously. Do you ever express thanks? You 
Did you ever think about expressing thanks? It's to be a mindset of a believer, actually. Can everything give thanks? I have to challenge teenagers to thank their parents for all they do for them. You know, several years ago, I was at a small graduation ceremony, and all those graduating stood up to say a few words, and I was disappointed that not one of them, I think there were 10 there, not one of them thanked their parents for all the sacrifice they did. This was a homeschool graduation. Not a one of them. I mean, the parents bent over backward to give them all that they could to give them a successful shot at life, and no thanks. I was disappointed. You know, Jan Patterson, visiting with her, she has terminal cancer. She's been so encouraged by those that are willing to just share a note. All the difference in the world. Mary has let me know. People have sent her all kinds of encouragement. And don't think for half a second it hasn't made a huge difference, because it has. You can be a bright spot in somebody's day. Do you take time to learn the promises of God, to share at appropriate times to be an encouragement to another believer? Proverbs 15.4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Well, that captures it well, doesn't it? Proverbs 12.18, we've already seen this. There's one who speaks like the piercings of the sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Do you seek to be a source of encouragement? Point people toward the Lord Jesus Christ? Anxiety in the heart of a man <clears throat> causes depression, but a good word, excuse me, <clears throat> makes it glad. We all know this one, right? A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Proverbs 10, 20 says, the, choi the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. You're to use words of education according to the need. According to the need. The whole implication there is that you're sensitive enough to understand what a person's real needs are. That you've developed a relationship, that there's a care there, there's a concern there. It doesn't mean you always know what's going on, but you recognize there's a need so that you can be some kind of a source of encouragement. I mean, sometimes you don't know what to say. I've been in that situation more times than I can count. What do I say here? I don't know, Lord. You know what they need. Give me wisdom to say the right thing, because I'm really good at taking one foot out and sticking the other one right in. Occasionally, I've been like a bull in a china shop, just a disaster. What do I've come to see in the 30, almost 37 years I've been saved is everyone's got needs, everyone's got issues. You peel back the layers under the surface, there's all kinds of issues. What someone, the last person someone needs is someone to come and step on them when they're down, step on their neck. Do you know the word of God? Have you learned promises that you can share to be a source of encouragement? ahead of myself here. Psalm 94, 19. Does anybody know it? In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. In fact, in Psalm 119, 50, this is what David said. This is my comfort and my affliction. Your words have given me life. See, when you share the word of God, those are the words of life. And you can put it in someone's heart, and the Spirit of God's going to take that word of God, and he's going to comfort their heart. Because God is what? I am all out of whack here. There it is. Hey, I'll just get a little ahead of myself and go back. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in our, all our tribulation. How is it that God comforts us in all our tribulation? There's only one way, through the word of God. This is the comfort of my affliction. Your word has given me life. You can read a couple of Hallmark cards, shed a tear or two, but the real comfort comes from the truth because Christ said you should know the truth and the truth sets you free. And when you receive comfort from the Lord, from the word of God, what does God want you to do? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with we ourselves are comforted by God. That's how God designed this thing to work. And so sometimes God will give you a trial so you can learn a promise you would have never learned otherwise. And after you learn that promise and it delivers you, you can then share it with your fellow dear saint in Christ and they can be built up and edified through it too. That's what it's all about. Right? You know, I try to keep in mind that God arranges my conversations, that he's sovereign over them and that I need to be sensitive in them and that this is happening for a reason. And so, Lord, make me sensitive to the need and speak with love as a motive. See, God wants your words to minister what? Grace to the hearers. Grace to the hearers. If your words are going to minister grace to the hearer, that means you've got to be thrilled with the grace of God yourself. And it requires an, an eternal perspective. I mean, Paul's in prison here. And it's not a bed of roses. And he says, you know what? I'm really hard-pressed between two. I have a desire to, be with, to, to get out of here and be with Christ, which is it's so far better. I, 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 I mean, what am I hanging on to here? What did he want to stick around for? Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. He wasn't concerned about himself. He was concerned about being used to the Lord so someone else could benefit. And I'm confident of this, and I know that I shall remain and continue with all for your progress and your joy of faith. You know, we tend to look at life from the standpoint, <clears throat> what am I going to get out of it? Paul's looking at life from the standpoint, what can I give in it for the benefit of someone else? This is why later, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, like me, Paul says, let's each esteem others better than me. Let each of you look out. I mean, you've got to look out for your own interests. That's life. But let's also look out for the interests of others. I mean, the New Testament bears out that it's, we're to have an others-oriented mindset. And we can be a vessel of edification. Because when you're all wrapped up in what's going on in your life, it's just an empty way to live. It's vain. And it's easy for all of us to be self-consumed. And frankly, the more self-consumed you are, I don't know how you can't be depressed. The more I look at my own life and I start evaluating and thinking, I'm thinking, oh, good grief. Then you watch the movie Airplane and it's over, right? I mean, the more you look at your own life, you're only going to focus on things that are going to bring you down. You focus on Christ, and you focus on the blessing. Count your blessings, name them one by one. And you see that, wow, God, you've got a plan for me. You've got me covered. All my needs are met in Christ. How do you want to use me to be a minister of grace to someone else through my words? <coughs> Excuse me. Boy, if you're stuck on yourself, though, you're not trusting the Lord. You become increasingly more negative and sarcastic, and so forth. It's only the focus on the Lord that's going to give you the capacity to be an instrument he can use to build someone else up. And this is to be true even to those who have wronged you. I'm not going to build that person up. I hope they die. He deserves to die. Oh, well, he probably does, and so do you. That's the way it is. You know, we're to have the mind of Christ. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, whoopee ding what credit is that to you for sinners do the same? If you lend to those from whom you know will pay you back, well, hey, big deal. Even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. 
Oh, let's look at it this a little differently. Let's love our enemies. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Let's do good. Let's lend, hoping for nothing in return. Keep it. <coughs> and your reward will be great. And you'll be sons of the Most High. For guess what? God is kind to the unthankful and the evil, which means he's kind to you. And he's kind to me. So let's be merciful. You mean you want me to say kind words to this person that's bad me and gossip me and ruin my reputation? Yeah, it's called the love of Christ. And the love of God has been shed and abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, which means the Spirit of God has the capacity to work in you and through you so you could be an edifier. You could minister grace to the hearers even though they'd like to see you dead and have done everything in their power to see that you die. So you've got to be intimately aware of the grace that God has shown you in life. If you got what you deserve today, you'd be in hell. So even though you can compare yourself to this guy that it's just meaner than a junkyard dog, you're no different. God has extended grace to you. He wants you to extend grace to them. And then you are free. You're free from the bondage of that person who hates you. That's how God designed this thing to work. Are you resting in the process, promises of God? Is your goal to be an instrument of someone's edification? Or are you trying to use them for whatever you can get out of them and then throw them to the curb like a bag of trash? That's what the world says you should do. Now he gives a reason here, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The reason is, unwholesome, corrupt words grieve the Holy Spirit, who is in you. Not only does, do these words hinder growth in Christ, it tears down the body of Christ, and it grieves God. The word grieve there, I don't know I did that means to feel deep emotion or physical pain and distress. There is the Spirit of God within you grieves when you have corrupt words that don't minister grace to the ears. Rarely do we think in terms naturally of how our actions affect God. We're wondering, what's God going to do for me lately? And God is saying, well, do you realize that that grieved me? And yet I love you anyway. Interesting, isn't it? You're grieving the one that who you belong to forever. Because it says here, we're sealed for the day of redemption. He put his mark of ownership upon you, says you belong to me and nothing will ever separate you from my love. But he's grieved. And he's saying here, you know, one day you're going to come to a point of complete redemption and your words will only be edifying. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if we were in a position where the only words that we could speak for were edifying words, how quiet would it be in here? Right? Ouch. This is a grace operation, in case you haven't figured it out. We are what we are by the grace of God. As I say, Lord, thank you for saving a wretch like me, and it's my privilege to be used however you see fit for the benefit of someone else, the whole focus of my life changes. But if I'm looking to milk something out of someone to get ahead and get what I want, and I want life on my terms, I'm not only miserable, but my words are going to indicate I'm miserable, and they're going to make other people miserable, because that's how it is. You know, years ago, someone came out with this called Think. I, I've seen it in posters in schools. Think is a true... H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? Now, if we just did that, I, th I think that would probably help. It's never good to take inventory and to think through some things. So 
Someone else came up with this. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. And a loving word may heal and bless. The potential for all of those is within all of us. We have a sin nature that is just absolutely determined to make sure that we are number one. We have the Spirit of God and the new nature in us that's absolutely determined to make Christ is glorified and Christ is number one. There's a battle going on within us. And without Christ, we can't do anything. So as we present ourselves to the Lord and allow the Spirit of God to transform us through the renewing of our mind and empower us, we can be ministers of grace to the hearers. I trust that's what you want. This is how we will go forward, even as a body, seeking to encourage one another and help one another and love one another. And it goes back to the cross. Christ loved us when we were unlovely. He gave us eternal life, though we deserve hell. He's given us all things to pertain to life and godliness. And he's called us to walk in a worthy manner to what he's given us in Christ. There's nothing in us that is good, and yet in Christ, it all can be done for his glory. So we have a choice. We can pierce with sarcasm or we can heal with words of wisdom. I trust you want the latter. Let's pray. Father, we're just humbled as we consider uh, the word of God, which is indeed alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that as a body we be of one mind and one accord, striving together for the faith of the gospel, seeking to build one another up and encourage one another as you would have. Thank you that the Spirit of God is able to do this in us and through us. May we present ourselves to you so that this can take place for your glory. So we give thanks and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.